The Holy Gospel for the fourth Sunday of Easter comes to us from the Gospel according to St. John, reading from the 10th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Glory to you, o Lord. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace be unto you in peace from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Over time, things change. Things change significantly, and they change often. And sometimes the change is uncomfortable, but sometimes there are developments, there are things that happen that are really, really good. Now I'm going to tell you about a new thing that was new at one point in time that is no longer new at all, but at one point in time it was exciting and new and fresh for us. We were living in Cameroon, and this was a long time ago, obviously, and things were difficult there because we had no electricity, we had no running water except we had a uh, water tower built and, and created our own system. And in order to get anywhere that you could buy groceries at or anything like that, it required a drive that sometimes in the rainy season would take 18 hours. And it was only 300 kilometers, 180 miles, but that 18 hours was some of the worst hours of your life. And if you've ever seen commercials for 4 by 4s um, five minutes of that is okay, 18 hours not so much. <laughs> so there we were. And that meant things were difficult. Things just weren't as they are now. In November of one year, I got a letter. And I noticed that it, it was posted in July, which was not uncommon. Sometimes it took three, four, five, six months for our mail to get there. Sometimes it never came. But this particular letter came in November, and it had been mailed in July. And in it, I was told that my grandfather had died. Now. There was nothing obviously that I could have done about that or there was no particular reason for which knowing about it would have helped. But still I felt bad, so bad that I didn't know. And I really regretted it. Well, of the responsibilities that I had there, I had to travel up to the main city for church meetings regularly. And on one such occasion I went up there and there was a, one of the missionaries up there um, is really into cutting edge stuff. He wants to do everything that he can to make life in the mission field simpler. And I noticed he was in his office late at night one night playing on his computer. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm checking my electronic mail. And I said, what's that? There was, there was no such thing. I had never heard of it before. And he said, well, it's this thing now where you can send messages back and forth almost instantly. And I thought, well, that's really cool. The problem was for us, even up in the big city, a telephone line was a bit iffy. And so he would start off this process and it would go and until it dialed itself onto the network. And sometimes it actually worked and we got a line. And he would check his email. And if he was really lucky, he was able to send a couple of emails as well. Our system there was never that good. but. 
It was so cool because we got a letter that had been written literally that morning. And we're reading it right now. It was just unheard of. And we talked about it. We said, oh, this is going to change life completely. Things are going to be so much better. Communication is going to be good. This is going to be wonderful. No more five-month periods of waiting for good news or bad news. We'll have information. And if we have information, we are strengthened. It was going to be life giving, life changing. It was exciting. I went home and I told mama about it and about this new thing that we're calling email because we wanted to be, you know, modern like everybody else. And she thought it was interesting. She thought it was something that would be good for her to keep in touch with the family. We all did. Well, as things developed, it was developing more quickly over here than it was there, obviously, but it was a good tool. It was helpful. It was a wonderful thing, and we became kind of reliant on it. Several years have passed. We still have email. And on any given day, I literally get dozens, sometimes literally hundreds of emails. And I have to tell you that my email now is such a burden, I, I can't possibly get out of it. In fact, uh, Peg, whom you all know, our former parish administrator, learned early on that unless it had a really cool and interesting subject line, there was some likelihood it would be lower on my priority list. Email, which was at one point in time such a blessing, started to suck the life out of me because you spend so much time going over one by one by one by one, all these emails. Life-giving or life-draining, things that we do for ourselves to improve our lives can quickly turn from one to the other. Have you noticed that? Even in terms of our careers, our jobs. Anybody here ever had a job that you really didn't like? You can't say that, John, you just started. <laughs> we sometimes have to do things because we need to do them. We sometimes have to do things because it's a matter of course. When I was in college, I was doing things in order to eat. Didn't like them particularly, but you had to do them, and they were. They were. When I was young, uh, in high school, and I wanted to earn extra money, the only thing that was available in the rural community in which we lived was picking rocks. Now, that is precisely what it sounds. You go out into the middle of a field in the Midwest and pick all these big, huge stones out and put them into a, a trailer, and they get hauled away. And you know what the worst part of it is? The darn things grow back next year. <laughs> It was a never-ending, horrible thing for which we didn't get paid very much, but that's what we had to do. So that when you finally get into a career, into a job that you find gratifying, in my case, preaching and teaching and that sort of thing, it is so liberating, it is so cool to be able to do what you want to do, to work in the kind of field that you really feel called for, it gives life to you. But you will also admit that there are times when your career, if you become too overburdened with it, can suck the life out of you. One of the things that I emphasize in premarital counseling always, 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 particularly to younger couples, is that you must never allow your career to overshadow your responsibility, your joyous responsibility to your family, to your children. And I'm one of the worst offenders. I seldom go home at a decent hour. I don't remember when the last time is I had a meal with my family at the table. And it's because I get obsessed. It's nobody's fault but mine. I manage myself in such a way that it's just not good. We take that which has been life-giving for us and find a way to turn it into something life-draining. Now. In terms of our text this morning, I want to share a notion with you that I think, I hope, you will find helpful. Jesus says to us in this text, which comes from the Johannian community, he says to us, I am the gate. And in through the gate you must come if you wish to have life. Any way other that you might come in, you are a thief and a bandit. This imagery was difficult for the disciples 
and those who are listening to understand, and it is for us as well. But I want to step back from the text and distill it down even a little bit further by making, first of all, a distinction between the different gospel texts. This particular Sunday is sometimes referred to as Good Shepherd Sunday when the, the notion or the emphasis is upon Jesus as being a shepherd. And you've heard that in some of the prayers, you'll hear it in some of the hymns. And this text talks about the sheepfold as well. But in our Bible, we have four Gospels. Um, I, I'm sort of in a testing mode. This is the testing day for the confirmation class. Uh, and I take great joy in doing that. I, I don't know why that is. I don't think the students do so much. Um, so therefore, I want to ask you, do you all know what the Gospels are? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? Of these four Gospels, sometimes we read them in a way that we just look at them in a, in, a, in a standard format and think that they're all the same from the same person, from the same place, from the same time, but they truly are different. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we sometimes refer to as the synoptic Gospels. That word means with the same vision, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They have similar stories told in slightly different orders, and they are progressively longer in terms of the oldest uh, to the youngest. And Mark being the oldest is the shortest of the three Gospels, little bits added in Luke, and then on to Matthew. Mark was probably written in the late 40s. Um, some put him even later, uh, after Jesus' death, 40 AD. That is to say, uh, if Jesus died around 30 AD, the Gospel might have been anywhere from 15 to 20 years later. The story's collected and told, but then eventually written down in the Gospel of Mark. And Luke and Matthew, even later than that. But the Gospel of John is probably about 120 AD, several years later. And the Gospel of John comes from a community that was formed, followers of the disciple, the beloved disciple of Jesus, whose name we know was John. And they gathered together into an ascetic community where they focused on living their lives according to the way they believed Jesus would want them to. And because it was quite a bit later on from Jesus' death, there were things that were going on in the Christian world that were troubling to them. Different kinds of heresies, different kinds of ideas that were coming up that tended to confuse people. Some people, for example, at that time were talking about Jesus' humanity as if Jesus was just one of the guys. And the Gospel of John, the writers of the Gospel of John wanted to emphasize more than anything else that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was none other than the Son of the living God. Jesus was true God, and they wanted to get that across in very important ways. And this is one of the texts that shows us how they did that. And they did it in this way. Have you ever noticed in the Gospel of John, there's a variety of texts that, that, talk, that have Jesus saying things like, I am the gate of the sheepfold and you were the sheep, or I am the good shepherd, I am the vine, you were the branches, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, those kinds of texts. All of those texts where Jesus says such a thing come to us in the Gospel of John. Now, without studying it a little further, we would not know why. The truth of the matter is that for people of the day, they would have got it right away. Because for them, Scripture was the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, one of the most important books of the, of the Torah is the book of Exodus. And in that book, we read when Moses is being commissioned by God to go forth and to rescue the people who were in captivity. He says to God, he's trying to find excuses. I'm not eloquent enough. I can't do this. Why would you send me? God says, it's okay, take Aaron with you, you can do it. And he's trying to find other excuses, and he finally says, well, if they ask who has sent me, what should I say? And God says this. And this one verse becomes the most profound identifier of who God is. God says to Moses, tell them, I am who I am has sent you. Do you hear that, I am? The whole ontological description of God, God as pure being. And now, this phrase, we get all wrapped up in knots about the gate and the gatekeeper and the shepherd and the way, the truth, and life, when really what we need to be wrapped up in is the I am. Because in those words, God is being identified as Jesus, and Jesus is being identified with God. 
So this text today is telling us it is an encouragement to the disciples who have taken much of their time and taken the things that they have known in terms of the law, in terms of things that are important to them, and made them into things that have become not life-giving anymore, but life-draining. And he's saying to them, that which is important here, brothers and sisters, is Jesus. Just Jesus. That which is truly important is not all of the things that we do to help ourselves, though they may be good. No one is trying to demonize everything. Email is a good thing. But too much of it can be difficult. All of the things that we have managed to create to help ourselves, to deepen our faith, to deepen our knowledge, all of these things are wonderful. But they can become life-draining as well. It is therefore important for us to know, it is important for us never ever to forget that the most important piece, the only important piece, is what it is that God has done for us in Christ Jesus. It is all about Jesus. The answer to your problems, the answer to your suffering, the answer to the unanswerable questions of life, the answer to ambiguity ambiguity and contingency, the answer to the vicissitudes of life which frustrate the life out of us, all of these things are found in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, as we go through life and experience some of the same confusion, sometimes overwhelmed by things that are designed to help us, overwhelmed by things that are supposed to be good, that we give lip service to, that we say, this is a good thing. It's because we've forgotten that the most important thing is Jesus. My prayer for you today as you go out from this day, out from this place, and as you reflect on Easter and what it is that God has done for us, that you remember this. No matter what the issue is, problems with work, difficulties in relationships, challenges with neighbors or friends, problems with family. My prayer is that you remember that the answer to all of this resides in Christ Jesus and your relationship with him. So I encourage you to deepen that relationship. Get to know Jesus just a little bit better. For in so doing, you will find comfort. And once you've done that, the second step, the second part of your job is to go out from this place and tell those people who feel lost, who feel overwhelmed, that there is an answer. There is a solution. And it's none of the things that we come up with, none of the solutions that we proffer to those who are suffering. It is only Jesus the Christ. Get to know Jesus, brothers and sisters, and share the news that there is an answer. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious Lord, we give you thanks this day that you provide us with opportunities to worship, to fellowship, and and to enjoy all of the good things that you provide for us. Help us as we go out from this place to understand that you are the answer to all of our needs. You are all sufficient and there is no more that we do need. Help us to take that which you've given us, that with which you've blessed us, to use it in the service of your people, so that all might come to know a saving relationship with you. Grant us grace, strength, and joy in knowing that you are our all in all. Indeed, our good shepherd. In your name we pray. Amen.